Assalamu alaikum and a good day to all of you. Now we're going to go into the first topic of organic compounds that is the alkenes. Call that alkenes are aliphatic hydrocarbons having carbon carbon and carbon hydrogen sigma bonds. They can be categorized as acyclic or cyclic. Acyclic alkenes have the molecular formula CN. H2n plus 2, where n is an integer, and contain only linear and branched chains of carbon atoms. They are also called saturated hydrocarbons because they have the maximum number of hydrogens per carbon. Cycloalkanes contain carbons that are joined in one or more rings. Because the general formula is CnH2n, they have two fewer hydrogens than an acyclic alkane with the same number of carbons. All carbon atoms in an alkane are surrounded by four groups, making them sp3 hybridized and tetrahedral. And all bond angles are 109.5 degrees. The three-dimensional representations and ball and stick models for these alkanes indicate the tetrahedral geometry around each carbon atom. In propane and higher molecular weight alkanes, the carbon skeleton can be drawn in a variety of ways and still represent the same molecule. For instance, we look at methane the Lewis structure is given as in the diagram and a 3D representation is when we see a wedge showing the bond that is pointing towards the viewer and the dashes that is going away from the plane of the paper and the straight lines are in the same plane as the paper. The ball and stick that model shows the, the angle of the bond the hydrogen-carbon-hydrogen bond is 109.5 degrees and the length of the carbon-hydrogen bond is 1.09 Armstrong. And the next one, ethane, the Lewis structure is as given and we can draw the 3D representation as in the given the structure and also the ball and stick diagram as given on the right hand side and the carbon carbon bond now is 1.53 Armstrong in length. For the three carbon alkane which is CH3, CH2, CH3 called propane, it has a molecular formula of C3H8. Note that in the 3D drawing that each carbon atom has two bonds in the plane which shows the solid lines. One bond in front on a wedge and one bond behind the plane on a dashed line. So each carbon atom is a tetrahedron, tetrahedron on its own. Okay, yeah. Pain and other higher molecular weight alkanes can be drawn in a variety, variety of ways. And can still represent the same molecule. For example, the three carbons of propane can be drawn in a horizontal row and or with a band. These representations are equi equivalent as we can see in the diagram given below. There are two different ways to arrange four carbon atoms given giving two compounds with molecular formula C4H10, named butane and isobutane. Butane and isobutane are isomers, two different, carb two different compounds with the same molecular formula. Specifically, they are constitutional or structural isomers. Constitutional isomers differ in the way the atoms are connected 
to each other. We can see the arrangement on the left butane we have four carbons in a row. This is a straight chain. On the right, we can see the isobutane structure. We have three carbons in a row with one carbon branched. This, the isobutane, is the common name. The IUPAC name for this compound is 2-methylpropane. Carbon atoms in alkanes and other organic compounds are classified by the number of other carbons directly bonded to them. A primary carbon is bonded to one other carbon. A secondary carbon is bonded to two other carbons. A tertiary carbon is bonded to three other carbon atoms. And a quaternary carbon is bonded to four other carbon atoms as can be seen in the given diagram. Hydrogen atoms are classified as primary, secondary or tertiary depending on the type of carbon atom to which they are bonded to. A primary hydrogen is on a carbon bonded to one other carbon atom. A secondary hydrogen is on a carbon bonded to two other carbon atoms and a tertiary hydrogen is on a carbon bonded to three other carbon atoms namely primary hydrogen is bonded to a primary carbon a secondary hydrogen will be bonded to a secondary carbon and a tertiary hydrogen is bonded to a tertiary carbon atom the maximum number of possible constitutional isomers increases dramatically as the number of carbon atoms in the alkane increases. There are 75 possible isomers for a molecular formula of alkanes containing 10 carbon atoms. The suffix A and E identifies a molecule as an alkane. By increasing the number of carbon atoms in an alkane, by a CH2 group, one obtains a homologous series of alkanes, as shown in Table 4.1. The CH2 group is called methyl. Okay, looking at Table 4.1, we can see as the number of carbon atom increases, the number of constitutional isomers also increases. Beginning with the number of carbon atoms, 4, we can see when we have four carbon atoms, there are two constitutional isomers. And as the number of the number of carbon atom increases from six, at six we have five, at eight we have eighteen, and at ten we have seventy-five. And when there are twenty carbon atoms, we can have until three thousand sixty-six, three hundred and nineteen constitutional isomers. Let us. Now look at cycloalkanes. Cycloalkanes have molecular formula CnH2n and contain carbon atoms arranged in a ring. Simple cycloalkanes are named by adding the prefix cyclo to the name of the acyclic alkane, having the same number of carbons. For instance, a carbon, a cycloalkane having Three carbon atoms is called a cyclopropane, four carbon atoms is called cyclobutane, five carbon atoms is called cyclopentane, and six carbon atoms is called cyclohexane. Alkanes can be named as according to the following rule. The first rule, the parent name indicates the number of carbons in the longest continuous chain. The suffix indicates what functional group is present. The prefix tells us the identity, location, and number of substituents attached to the carbon chain. The first, as we can see now, it would be the longest chain is represent that is actually the parent chain. The prefix shows all the substituents and the suffix will show all the functional groups. 
carbon substituents bonded to a long carbon chain are called alkyl groups. An alkyl group is formed by, re by removing one hydrogen atom from an alkane. To name an alkyl group, we just change the A and E ending of the parent alkane to YL. Thus, methane CH4 becomes methyl CH3 dash and ethane becomes ethyl which is CH3 CH2 dash. Naming three or four carbon alkyl groups is more complicated because the parent hydrocarbons have more than one type of hydrogen atom. For example, propane has both primary and secondary hydrogen atoms and removal of these hydrogen atoms form a different alkyl group with a different name. Removal of a primary hydrogen atom from the propane will give the propyl group and removal of a secondary hydrogen atom will give the isopropyl group. In order to name alkanes, first step you need to do is find the parent carbon chain and add the suffix. The parent carbon chain is not necessarily in a straight line. It can be in a straight line or it can be bent as given in the diagram given below. As long as we look for the longest chain where there are the maximum number of carbon atoms. We do not consider the second, uh, the, the one on the right because it only has seven carbon atoms in the longest chain. We always look for the one that has the most carbon atoms as in this example, which is the eight carbon in the longest chain. In this example, note that there are two chains of equal length. So we pick the chain with the more substituents. Circle the longest continuous chain as shown in the diagram on the left. This results in the greater number of substituents. That is the substituents consisting of a methyl and an ethyl. But the number of substituents on the right is an isopropyl. So the one that is correct is the one that has seven atoms in the longest chain and two substituents. Number the atoms in the carbon chain to give the first substituent the lowest number. For instance, we number the chain from left to right in the example given below and not from right to left. If the first substituent is the same distance from both ends, number the chain to give the second substituent the lower number. For instance, the one on the left shows the CH3 groups at C2, C3 and C5, whereas the second shows the CH3 groups at C2, C4 and C5. So the correct is when the second substituent has the lower number. Assign the lower number alphabetically to the first substituent. For instance, we look, there are two different groups equidistant from the ends. So numbering from left to right, we will have ethyl at carbon number 3 and methyl starting with N at carbon number 5. So the earlier letter would be the lower number. On the right, we can see the methyl would be at carbon number 3, whereas the ethyl is at carbon number 5. This is incorrect. Name and number the substituents. Name the substituents as alkyl groups. Every carbon belongs to either the longest chain or a substituent. Each substituent needs its own number. If two or more identical substituents are bonded to the longest chain, use prefixes to indicate how many. Di for two, tri for three groups, tetra for four groups. As in the example given below, we see we have a methyl at carbon number two, and then 
That is an ikal at carbon number 5 and another ikal at carbon number 6. So, we will name the ikal as 2, 6, di ikal. Combine the substituent names and numbers plus the parent and suffix. Precede the name of the parent by the names of the substituents. Alphabetize the names of the substituents, ignoring all prefixes except iso, as in isopropyl and isobutyl. Separate numbers by commas and separate numbers from letters by hyphens. For instance, you can see in the given example, the longest chain has eight carbon atoms, so it is the parent is going to be obtained and at carbon number 2 and carbon number 6 we have methyl groups there is 2 methyl groups so it's 2, 6, dimethyl at carbon number 5 we have an ethyl so that will be 5, ethyl then we put the pieces of the name together first of all, first of all the substituent names which is alphabetized which is Ethyl first, so 5 ethyl, and then methyl, which is 2 6 dimethyl, plus the number of carbon atoms, which is octane. So the answer for or the name for this compound is 5 ethyl, 2 6 dimethyl octane. For cycloalkanes, we use cyclo, the word cyclo will immediately precede the name of the parent compound. First of all, we will have the prefix, which are the substituents, and then the ring is given by the word cyclo, plus the parent and the suffix. The parent will tell us the number of carbons in the ring. And first of all, we look at this given the Example, we have six carbons in the ring, which is cyclohexane. We need to name and also number the substituents. For instance, in the example given, the cyclohexane has a methyl group, so it becomes methyl cyclohexane. And the one on the right, which is a cyclopentane, has a tertiary butyl group, so it is a tertiary butyl cyclopentane. For rings with more than one substituent, we begin numbering at one substituent and proceed around the ring to give the second substituent the lowest number. For instance, we see the ring has six carbon atoms. So going clockwise, the first methyl is number one and the second methyl is at carbon number three. And the name is 13 dimethyl cyclohexane. We, are, we will not number the ring going anticlockwise as given in the right because then we will have 1 and 5 dimethyl which is incorrect. With two different substituents, we number the ring to assign the lower number to the substituents al alphabetically. In the given example, we have substituents ethyl and methyl. So, since ethyl is alphabetically earlier than methyl, we will use the number 1 for ethyl and number 3 for methyl. And the correct name for this compound is 1-ethyl-3-methyl cyclohexane, not as the one on the right. Let us look now at two constructions contrasting examples when naming compounds containing both a ring and a long chain of carbon atoms. The first example, the ring has more carbon atoms than the chain. So, the ring is the parent and the chain is the substituent. So, we name the cyclohexane with a substituent that is butyl cyclohexane. The one on the right, the chain has six carbon atoms, whereas the ring has only four carbon atoms. So now the ring is the substituent and 
the parent is the hexane and the name of this compound is 1 cyclobutyl hexane let us look now at more examples of cycloalkane nomenclature the first we can see a cyclobutane with only one substituent so no number is needed and the name is ethyl cyclobutane the one on the right twig has two substituents so we need to assign the lower number to the first substituent that is going to be said alphabetically which is B butyl before N methyl and the name is 1 set butyl 3 methyl cyclohexane and the one on the lower row which is that has two methyl groups and we name this compound as 1 2 dimethyl cyclohexane and not 1 6 and for the last one we have 1 2 and 4 triethyl cyclopentane not 1 3 4 or 1 3 5 the most common source of alkanes are fossil fuels many alkanes occur naturally in nature primarily in natural gas and petroleum natural gas is composed largely of methane with lesser amounts of ethane propane and butane Petroleum is a complex mixture of compounds, most of which are hydrocarbons containing 1 to 40 carbon atoms. Distilling crude petroleum, also called refining, separates it into usable fractions that differ in boiling points. So the first you can see from the carbon 5 carbons to 12 carbons is the gasoline and kerosene comes between C12 and C16 and diesel fuel between C15 and C18. Figure 4.5 shows a picture of a refining crude petroleum into usable fuel and other petroleum products. We have an oil refinery. At an oil refinery, crude petroleum is separated into fractions of similar boiling points by the process of distillation. And I can see on the diagram on the right a refinery tower as crude petroleum is heated the lower boiling point more volatile components distill first followed by fractions of progressively higher boiling points let us now look now at the physical properties of alkenes the first we are going to discuss is boiling point as we saw in chapter 3 before the first thing that determines boiling point is the polarity of the compound. All alkenes have low boiling points compared to more polar compounds of comparable size. Let us compare propane, acetaldehyde and ethanol. They have more or less the same molecular weight. Propane has a molecular weight of 44, so does acetaldehyde but ethanol has a molecular weight of 46 in propane there is only van der Waals forces but in acetaldehyde we have van der Waals forces and also dipole dipole moments in ethanol we have all three van der Waals forces dipole dipole moments and also hydrogen bonding because of the difference in the polarity, we see the boiling point for propane is minus 42 degrees Celsius, for acetaldehyde 21 degrees Celsius, and for ethanol that it is 79 degrees Celsius. That is increasing the strength of intermolecular forces will increase the boiling point. The next factor we look at is the number of the increase in surface area which shows in the number of carbon as the number of carbons increases the surface area also increases from butane that has a boiling point of 0 degrees Celsius we go to pentane with a boiling point of 36 degrees Celsius 
and the next is hexane that has 69 has a boiling point of 69 degrees celsius that is as the surface area increases the boiling point also increases and another uh, and another factor that determines boiling point is branching as we can see in the examples given the first is a new pentane a new pentane has a boiling point of 10 degrees Celsius. It has the lowest uh, surface area because of branching. And then the next one, the isopentane has a boiling point of 30 degrees Celsius as compared to pentane that has 36 degrees Celsius. Therefore, increasing surface area will also increase the boiling point. The next physical property that we are looking at is the melting point. Alkenes have low melting points compared to more polar com compounds of comparable size. In the example given below, we are going to look at the difference between propane and acetaldehyde. Both have the same molecular weight, but propane only have van der Waals forces, whereas in acetaldehyde, it also has dipole-dipole moments. The, oil, the melting point of uh, propane is minus 190 degrees Celsius, whereas that of acetaldehyde is minus 121 degrees Celsius. So we can see as the strength of the intermolecular forces increases, the melting point also increases. The next we are going to look at is the increase in the number of carbons will also increase in the surface area. Increasing surface area will also increase the melting point as in the example given. You can see in butane, butane has only four carbon atoms. The melting point of butane is minus 138 degrees Celsius, whereas in hexane, the melting point is minus 96 degrees Celsius. Another factor that also affects melting point is the structure of the molecule. Therefore, when a molecule is more symmetrical, it will have a, a more closed packing and the melting point will also increase. As in the example given below, we see the isopentane has a melting point of minus 160 degrees Celsius whereas the neopentane has a melting point of minus 17 degrees Celsius. The next physical property that we are going to look at is solubility. So all alkenes are soluble in organic solvents, but they are all insoluble in water. Let us now look at conformations of acyclic alkenes. Conformations are different arrangements of atoms that are interconverted by rotation about single bonds. We look at the example given. Between the carbon-carbon atoms, there is free rotation. So there are actually two different conformations. One we call the staggered conformation and the other is the eclipse conformations. So as we can see in the diagram, looking looking at the red ball, the first is a staggered conformation and the second is an eclipse conformation. Okay, as we saw just now, in the eclipse conformation, the carbon hydrogen bonds on one carbon atom are directly aligned with the carbon hydrogen bonds on the adjacent carbon atom. Whereas in the staggered conformation, the carbon hydrogen bonds are on one carbon uh, in, on one carbon atom bisects the hydrogen carbon hydrogen bond angle on the adjacent carbon atom. We look at the one the diagram on the left shows an eclipse conformation where all the carbon hydrogen bonds are all aligned. And when we rotate this 60 degrees, we will get the staggered conformation. And in this confirmation, we see the carbon-hydrogen bonds 
uh, the ones in front bisects the ones that are at the back. Eclipse confirmation, the carbon hydrogen bonds are aligned. And this is the, when we rotate 60 degrees, this is the staggered confirmation. The carbon hydrogen bonds in front bisect the carbon hydrogen bonds at the back. Okay. This dihedral angle is zero. Zero dihedral angle. And when we rotate this 60 degrees. So now the dihedral angle here from here to here is 60 degrees. This is the staggered conformation. Yeah. Rotating the atoms on one carbon atom by 60 degrees converts an eclipse conformation into a staggered conformation and vice versa. The angle that separates a bond on one atom from a bond on an adjacent atom is called a dihedral angle. For ethane, in the staggered conformation, the dihedral angle of the stage bond is 60 degrees. For the eclipse conformation, it is 0 degrees, as we see in the given diagram below. We are now going to draw a Newman projection. Look directly down the carbon-carbon bond and we draw a circle with a dot in the center to represent the both the carbons. Okay, there. We draw in the lines of the bonds. First, the three lines in front and then we draw the three lines at the back. These are the bonds in front and these are the bonds at the back. We add in the hydrogen atoms on each bond. There are three hydrogens on each carbon atom. Three in front and three at the back. Okay, figure 4.6 shows Newman projections for the staggered and eclipse conformations of ethane. This is the staggered conformation. The dihedral angle between the two hydrogen atoms is 60 degrees. Okay. This is the eclipse conformation of ethane. The dihedral angle between these two bonds is zero. the Newman projections for the staggered and eclipse conformations of propane, rotating about the, C, the first carbon and the second carbon. This is the first carbon and the second carbon. This is the staggered conformation of propane. From in the front, we can see there are three hydrogen atoms and at the back, there is a methyl with, methyl with two hydrogen atoms atoms pointing downwards. The difference in energy between staggered and eclipse conformers is approximately 3 kilocalories per mole. 
with each eclipse carbon hydrogen bond contributing one kilocalorie per mole the energy difference between staggered and eclipse conformers is called torsional energy torsional strain is an increase in energy caused by eclipsing interactions let us look now at figure 4.8 shows a diagram of energy versus the dihedral angle for ethane the ethane given here there is one carbon hydrogen uh, there is one hydrogen that is labeled red you can see in the first uh, eclipse conformation the red is at the top and when we change when we twist 60 degrees it gets into the staggered conformation and then another 60 degrees will give it the eclipse conformation another 60 degrees from there the staggered conformation and eclipse and anti and so on and, and uh, we can see the difference between the eclipse and the staggered conformation the energy difference is 3 kilocalories per mole and we note that at any given moment all ethane molecules do not exist in the more stable staggered conformation rather a higher percentage of molecules is present in the more stable staggered conformation than any other possible arrangement an energy minimum and maximum occurs at every 60 degrees as the conformation changes from staggered to eclipse looking at butane butane have several carbon carbon bonds capable of rotation it takes six 60 degrees rotations to return to the original conformation figure 4.9 shows six different conformations of butane rotation about the carbon 2 and carbon 3 bonds the first is a staggered conformation and on rotation will give the eclipse conformation and another 60 degrees will give a staggered gorge conformation and then another 60 degrees will give the eclipse conformation and another 60 degrees will give another gorge and staggered conformation and six, another 60 degrees will get back to the eclipse conformation and back again another 60 degrees to the staggered anti conformation a staggered conformation with two larger groups 100 80 degrees from each other is called anti. A staggered conformation with two larger groups 60 degrees from each other is called gorge. The staggered conformations are lower in energy than the eclipse conformations. The relative energies of the individual staggered conformations depend on their steric strain. Steric strain is an increase in energy resulting when atoms are forced too close to one another. Gorge conformations are generally higher in energy than anti conformations because of steric strain. This is the anti conformation of butane. The two methyl groups are 180 degrees apart from each other, so it is lower in energy. And the gorge conformation, when we change, when we turn this. 60 degrees you can see that there is a, the methyl and the methyl are 60 degrees from each other so this is the gorge conformation and it is much higher in energy and the last is the this is what we can see this is the eclipse conformation the, in the eclipse conformation there is a lot of steric strain both the methyl groups are close together figure 4.10 shows a graph of energy versus dihedral angles for butane the staggered conformations 1 3 and 5 are at energy minima anti-conformation Anti-conformation 1 
is lower in energy than the gauge conformations 3 and 5, which possess steric strain. Eclipse conformations 2, 4 and 6 are at energy maxima. Eclipse conformation 4 has additional steric strain due to two eclipse CH3 groups and this is highest in energy. Table 4.3 shows a summary of torsional and steric strain energies in acyclic alkenes. We look at the type of interaction. Hydrogen-hydrogen eclipsing has energy of 1 kilocalorie per mole. Hydrogen-methyl eclipsing has 1.5 kilocalorie per mole. Methyl-methyl eclipsing interaction has an energy of 4 kilocalorie per mole and the gauge CH3 groups is 0 0.9 kilocalories per mole. The energy difference between the lowest and the highest energy conformations is called a barrier to rotation. Since the lowest energy conformation has all bonds staggered and all large groups empty, alkenes are often drawn in a zigzag skeletal structure to indicate this, as seen in the following diagram. We now go on to cycloalkanes. Besides torsional strain and steric strain, the conformations of cycloalkanes are also affected by angle strain. Angle strain is an increase in energy when bond angles deviate from the optimum tetrahedral angle of 109.5 degrees. The Bayes strain theory was formulated when it was thought that rings were flat. It states that larger rings would be very highly strained as their bond angles would be very different from the optimum 109.5 degrees. It turns out that cycloalkanes with more than three carbon atoms in the ring are not flat molecules. They are puckered to reduce strain. Let us now look at the difference in the angles of certain cycloalkanes. In the cyclopropane, the angle is 60 degrees, whereas in cyclobutane, it is 90 degrees. And in cyclopecane, it is 144 degrees. So we have small internal angle strains, and we also have large internal angle strains as compared to the an angle for a tetrahedral carbon which is 109.5 degrees. Let us look at figure 4.11. Figure 4.11 shows three dimensional structure of some cycloalkanes. The first shows cyclobutane, the next cyclopentane, cycloheptane and cyclodecane. Let us look now at cyclohexane. If a cyclohexane ring were flat, then the internal bond angle would be 120 degrees. There would be angle strain since this angle is more than 109.5 degrees. There would also be torsional strain since all the hydrogens would be aligned, eclipsed to each other. In reality, Cyclohexane adopts a pocket chair conformation, which is more stable than any other possible conformation. Skeleton of the chair conformation can be drawn as seen in the diagram. The chair conformation is so stable because it eliminates angle strain, which is uh, the carbon-carbon angles are all 109.5, and it also eliminates torsional strain because all the hydrogens are on the adjacent carbon atoms are staggered to each other, as seen in the diagram. This is the model of a cyclohexane. You can see all the axial bonds are in green. There are one, two, three axial bonds on top, and there are one, two, three axial bonds going down. And we also have in cyclohexane three carbons up one two three 
and three carbon butter down. One, two, three. Alternating around the ring. So each carbon in the cyclohexane has two different kinds of hydrogens, which is one, the axial hydrogens. These are all the one, all the ones in greens are the axial hydrogens, and the ones in white are all the equatorial hydrogens. And they are all located in the plane of the ring, that is around the equator. And we draw the cyclohexane ring in the chair conformation. We just do this. We have one, two, three carbons buffering up, and we have one, two, three carbons buffering down. So this is the up, and this is the down carbon. And you can see there are two kinds of hydrogens. This is axial, and this is equatorial. This is axial going down, and this is equatorial that is going all, all axial bonds are oriented above or below the ring. And equatorial bonds are oriented around the equator. Let us now draw the chair conformation of cyclohexane. First of all, we put in a wedge. And then the parallel lines. And another Join them up all together. And then you can see the bottom three carbon atoms are off out of comes out of the bridge. The bottom three one, two, three carbons, these three carbons comes out of the bridge. So we fold them up. And we label the up carbons. These are all the up carbons. One, two, three. And three down carbons. One, two, and three. And then we draw in the axial hydrogens. Note that for all the carbons that is pointing up, the axial is also pointing up. One, two, three. And for all the carbons that is pointing down, the axial is also pointing down. One, two, three. Now we fill in all the hydrogen atoms for the axial bonds. We now draw in all the equatorial hydrogens. When the axial is pointing up, the equatorial points down. These are the equatorial hydrogens pointing down. And when the hydrogen axials are pointing down, the equatorial be pointing up. One, two, three hydrogens pointing up. So, you can see now all the hydrogens are all green. And, they are in the An important conformational change in cyclohexane involves ring clipping. Ring clipping is a two-step process. The so, when we draw a ring, let's see how it clips. The first is as a, as a result of ring clipping, you can see the up carbons will go down and the down carbons will be up. This is the down carbon. One, two, three. This down carbon is now up here. One, two, three. And the up carbon. One, two, three will go down. One, two, and three. Axial and equatorial hydrogens are 
into converted during a ring flip. All axial hydrogens, all axial hydrogens, for instance, will be equatorial hydrogens, and they are still facing. This is up, and this is also up, facing in the same direction. And this is the equatorial hydrogen when it this carbon flips down, so it will be at the axial going down. Ring flipping interconverts axial and equatorial hydrogens in the cyclohexane. Now we see these are the up axial hydrogens. And when we change this flip, first it becomes the boat conformation. You can see the boat conformation. And then we'll flip this will flip down and this will be the other conformation. Now we can see that all the hydrogen atoms that were at the axial are now at the equatorial and all the hydrogen atoms that were at the equatorial at is now the axial hydrogens. The chair forms of cyclohexane are 7 kilocalories per mole more stable than the boat forms. The boat conformation is destabilized by torsional strain because the hydrogens on the four carbon atoms in the plane are eclipsed. Additionally, there is steric strain because two hydrogens at either end of the boat, that is the flat pole hydrogens, are forced close to each other. As you can see, in the 4.14 shows two views of the boat conformation of cyclohexane. We see the boat, conform the boat form of cyclohexane is less stable than the two chair forms for two reasons. First, eclipsing interactions between hydrogens cause torsional strain. And the second, the proximity of the flat pole hydrogens causes steric strain. Note that the equatorial position has more room than the axial position, so larger substituents are more stable in the equatorial position. There are two possible chair conformations of a mono substituted cyclohexane, such as methyl cyclohexane. Let us see now how we can draw the two conformations for a substituted cyclohexane. First of all, we draw one chair form and add the substituents. Draw the one chair form, arbitrarily pick a ring carbon, classify it as up or down and draw the bonds. Each carbon has one axial and one equatorial bond. Add the substituents, in this case hydrogen or methyl. Arbitrarily placing one axial and one equatorial. In this example, the CH3 group is drawn equatorial. This forms one of two possible chair conformations labeled confirmation one. In step two, we do a ring flip. When the ring is flipped, that means we convert the up carbons to down carbons and vice versa. The chosen up carbon now tuckers down. In, in step three, we add the substituents to the second Confirmation. Draw axial and equatorial bonds. On a down carbon to the axial bond is down. And we do ring flipping, converts axial bonds to equatorial bonds and vice versa. The equatorial methyl becomes axial. This forms the other possible chair confirmation labeled confirmation 2. Note that the two conformations of cyclohexane are different, so they are not equally stable. Larger axial substituents create destabilizing and thus are not favorable. And this destabilizing effect we call the 1-3 diaxial interactions. In methyl cyclohexane, each unfavorable, unfavorable hydrogen-methyl interaction destabilizes the conformation 
by 0 0.9 kilocalorie per mole. So confirmation 2 is 1.8 kilocalorie per mole less stable than confirmation 1. In the cis 1, 2 dimethyl cyclopentane, both the methyl groups are on the same side. Now we can see the, the methyl group is at the equatorial position. The methyl group has more room. This is the preferred confirmation. And if we were to flip this, we will see now the methyl has gone to the axial position. And there is one, one, three diaxial interactions. An axial methyl group has unfavorable steric interactions. Okay, for a substituted cyclohexane, the larger the substituent on the six-membered ring, the higher the percentage of the confirmation containing the equatorial substituent at equilibrium. With a large substituent like tertiary butyl, essentially none of the confirmation containing an axial tertiary butyl group is present at room temperature. So, the ring is essentially anchored in a single confirmation having an equatorial tertiary butyl group. Look at the figure 4.16. The two confirmations of tertiary butyl cyclohexane. When the tertiary butyl cyclo, when the tertiary butyl group is at the axial, we see it is very crowded because it is there is one three diaxial interaction between the tertiary butyl with the axial hydrogens. But when the tertiary butyl is at the equatorial, we find that the large tertiary butyl group is pointing away from the ring and the large tertiary butyl group anchors the cyclohexane ring in this conformation. Now let us look at disubstituted cycloalkanes. There are two different 1,2-dimethyl cyclopentanes. One having two methyl groups on the same side of the ring and one having them on opposite sides of the ring. Let us look at the example given below. In the first, in A, we can see both the methyl groups are on the same side of the ring. So, it is called the cis isomer. But for B, both the methyl groups are on opposite sides. This is the trans isomer. A and B are known to be are known to be called cis trans isomers. So they are specifically stereo isomers. In the trans dimethyl 1, 2 dimethyl cyclopentane, both the methyl groups are on the opposite directions. One up and one down. A di substituted cyclohexane such as 1,4-dimethyl cyclohexane also has cis and trans stereoisomers. In addition, each of these stereoisomers has two possible chair conformations. Trans 1,4-dimethyl cyclohexane and cis 1,4-dimethyl cyclohexane. Cis and trans isomers are named by adding the prefixes cis and trans to the name of the cyclo cycloalkane. Thus, the cis isomer would be named cis 1,4-dimethyl cyclohexane and the trans isomer would be named trans 1,4-dimethyl cyclohexane. We are now going to see how to draw two conformations for a disubstituted cyclohexane. First, we draw one chair form and we add the substituents. For trans 1,4-dimethyl cyclohexane, we draw arbitrarily pick two carbons located at 1,4 to each other, classify them as up or down carbons, and draw in the substituents. The trans isomer must have one group above the ring and on an up bond and one group below the ring on a down bond. The 
the substituents can either be axial or equatorial as long as one is up and one is down. The easiest trans isomer to visualize has two axial CH groups. The arrangement is said to be diaxial. This forms one of the two possible chair conformations labeled conformation 1. In the second step, we do a ring flip. So, the down carbon will be going up and the up carbon will be going down. And in step 3, we add in the substituents to the second conformation. Ring flipping converts axial bonds to equatorial bonds and vice versa. The diaxial CH3 groups become diequatorial. This trans conformation is less obvious to visualize. It is still trans because one CH3 group is above the ring on an up bond and one is below on a down bond. This is seen as in confirmation 2. Confirmations 1 and 2 are not equally stable because confirmation 2 has both larger CH3 groups in the equatorial position. It is lower in energy. The cis isomer has two substituents on the same side, either both on up bonds or both on down bonds. A trans isomer has two substituents on opposite sides, one up and one down. Whether substituents are axial or equatorial depends on the relative location of the two substituents, that is on carbons 1 and 2, 1 and 3, or 1 and 4. We look at the diagram given. Both the methyl groups are found in the axial position and this is the more crowded position. When the chair flips, the methyl groups will be in the equatorial position and the diequatorial position is the more stable conformation. Figure 4.17 shows the two conformations of cis 14 dimethyl cyclohexane. A cis isomer has two groups on the same side of the ring, either both up or both down. In this example, conformations 1 and 2 have both the methyl groups drawn up. Both conformations have one methyl group axial and one equatorial, making them both equally stable. We are now going to look at the reactions of alkanes. The first is oxidation. Alkanes actually are the only family of organic molecules that have no functional group. Consequently, they undergo very few reactions. One reaction that alkanes undergo is combustion. Combustion is an oxidation reduction reaction. Recall that oxidation is the loss of electrons and reduction is the gain of electrons. So, so, to determine if an organic compound undergoes oxidation or reduction, we concentrate on the carbon, of, on the carbon atoms of the starting material and the product and compare the relative number of carbon hydrogen and carbon Z bonds, where Z is an element more electronegative than carbon, usually oxygen, nitrogen or a halide. Oxidation results in an increase in the number of CZ bonds or oxidation results in a decrease in the number of carbon-hydrogen bonds. Reduction results in a decrease in the carbon-Z bonds or reduction results in an increase in the number of CH bonds. In figure 4.18, we see the oxidation and reduction of a carbon compound. We can starting from the leftmost methane. This is the most reduced form of carbon. First oxidation state gives it methanol. Second oxidation state will give it the methanol. And the third oxidation state gives it the formic acid and the 
and the most oxidized form of carbon is carbon dioxide. So when we go from left to right, the number of CO bonds increases and, and we can see for reduction, the number of CH bonds will be decreasing. Volcanoes undergo combustion, that is, they burn in the presence of oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water. This is an example of oxidation. We can see every CH bond and CC bond in the starting material is converted to a CO bond in the product. The methane, when burns in oxygen, will form carbon dioxide and water. And the other example given that is 224 trimethylpentane when it burns in oxygen it will form 8 moles of carbon dioxide and 9 moles of water with when and heat is released lipids are biomolecules that are soluble in organic solvents and insoluble in water lipids have varied sizes and shapes and a diverse number of functional groups. Lipids are composed of many non-polar CH and CC bonds and have a few polar functional groups. The metabolism of lipids provides energy for our bodies. Figure 4.20 shows representatives of lipid molecules. We have a component of beeswax which has two long hydrocarbon chains and EGF2-alpha and also cholesterol. Cholesterol is a member of the steroid family, a group of lipids having four rings joined together. Because it has just one polar hydroxide group, it is insoluble in the aqueous medium of the blood. The non-polar hydrocarbon skeleton of cholesterol is embedded in the non-polar interior of the cell membrane. Its rigid carbon skeleton stiffens the fluid liquid bilayer, giving it strength. Cholesterol's polar hydroxide group is oriented towards the aqueous media inside and outside the cell.